Hello and welcome back to ELT Under the Covers and ELT React, where we, English language teaching professionals, we look at the good and the bad mm -hmm. of English teaching on the internet. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at Grammar Girl. But first, introductions. I am Neil of Team Teacher Fame, and I'm joined by a grammar guy. He's quick, he's dirty, he's Professor Rich. Hello, everybody. <laughs> grammar. Oh, yes. I used to be I used to be a bit of a grammar guy. I did, actually. And I used really? to defend it as well. And it really took me a long time to come around. You know, I have a problem with just I don't know if you've noticed this, Neil. I'm a bit of a contrarian and I have a problem with just accepting what I'm told. And I really felt, you know, throughout my CELTA, my early experiences with British Council Valencia um, and with teacher trainers early on kind of looking down their nose at some kid who's only got five years experience in the industry and all the rest of it thinks he knows everything and um you know i just i just i didn't really take well to this idea of throwing grammar out the window and in uh, everything's inductive inductively taught because no one would ever back it up they just kind of throw it at you and say you know yeah grammar that's a bit old school isn't it you know, and you saw this marketing stuff as well, don't you? Like, learn English with no grammar, right? Uh, so I kind of backlashed against that and kind of said, well, you know, maybe there is some useful things to say about grammar. And I think I've, I think I've finally caved on that. But because I found my own way there, not because someone tried to tell me about it. Yeah. And, of course, the advantage of being like that, of sort of not accepting what you've told and deciding to kind of go your own journey is that eventually when you get there to let's call it the more truthful position, uh -huh. you have a really good understanding of why, how, and things like that, uh, you know? So what is it about, you know, what I think to understand the limitations of grammar learning, with language learners, you really have to have quite a lot of experience and you really have to have an understanding of a lot of things. It's not something you can just answer with one question, mm -hmm. with, one, um, with one thing, you know. Like one thing you could talk about, for example, is the impact it has on fluency. You know, if you focus on the grammar of things, then it's kind of something that hangs hangs over students in a negative way in terms of their fluency for a long time. And even though you've given them that incredible flexibility to piece those puzzle pieces together using whatever grammar rules you've taught them, it takes a long time for them to get faster at it and better at it. And even when they do, they tend to sort of struggle with things like connected speech and phrasal pronunciation. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can sort of see when you've had someone who's been taught in a very grammatical way that they kind of plonk words together, plonk, plonk, plonk. And that, of course, grammar learning is not the only, the only kind of thing that causes that to happen. It's just one of the things that, that causes it to happen. And, and really, if you just completely eliminate grammar from let's say your lesson plan and that's not to say that it wouldn't get mentioned if a certain question come up or someone wanted to know whether this thing is followed by this form or that form but if you kind of eliminate it from your lesson plan and and move over to a more kind of lexical approach which is something we should talk about at some stage yeah because there's there's definitely something to be said for the lexical approach michael lewis definitely hit on something there that i think a lot of people kind of understood but I think he 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 really put it together in a good way. Um, when you do that, you start to see people's fluency <clears throat> improve in a really uh, um, well. You start to see their fluency improve. I mean, let's let's just put it as that. Mm -hmm. You know, you actually see their fluency improve. And no matter how much kind of rote practice you give someone, if they don't have that realization that going word for word, you know, subject plus verb plus whatever. Um, if they don't have that understanding that that's going to constantly limit them and they, they don't understand how to get beyond that stage mm -hmm. other than people telling them this really nebulous, like 
um, almost mythological advice like stop thinking in Spanish or whatever the hell that means, you know, yeah. uh, which don't, I don't think helps people at all. But really what they're getting at is they, this limit, they have this limitation because, because they're so obsessed by the grammar. And I think, you know, that's just, one, that's just one thing I would say. So just one thing I would say is that the fluency side of things, <clears throat> you know, the next thing that I'm not going to talk about because otherwise we'll end up going on about this forever. But the next thing that immediately comes to my mind is um, how having a rule can really give you hangups about language that you really experience in the real world. Mm -hmm. So you'll often get these students who've learned all these rules and then something happens, they see something, someone says something, they go, but that's wrong. Right. Yeah. And then the teacher has to explain that it's an exception, right? I, um, I'm and basically walking around with a little sign that whenever I say a rule, I just flash it up and it says, except, <laughs> but there will be some exceptions. <laughs> it kind yeah, of feels like the, the fine print, the, the little asterisks at the bottom whenever you give a, a grammar explanation. Yeah. So it's kind of, I can I see the point of, well, why why give these explanations and deep dive into it there'll in be, the first place? There'll be loads of exceptions. You know, um, a lot of kind of semantics people, linguistic semantics and um, what do you call it? Uh, theoretical syntax type people, not semantics, sorry, I meant syntax. Uh, theoretical syntax people. Well, they, they will we say can that, just say it's all semantics. <laughs> yeah, we can, but then we... <laughs> Then we're becoming communists, Neil. So that's what they are. <laughs> so they, they, that's these like really heavy grammar communists. <laughs> these really or communists. Oh, uh, so that's where that's that's uh, these these people who are heavily into theoretical syntax will tell you that one of the most hard and fast rules about English is the need for a subject. English is something where you you damn well need a subject, right? So if you're going to teach someone like a base grammatical rule of English, it's that a verb has a subject, right? That's like the base particle, I am, right? Am I, as a question, still got a subject, right? Mm -hmm. Except it does. that has an exception, right? And how do they explain that? Well, here's the, the exception is like, go there. The, the, where, what's the subject of go? Well, I guess it's you, but I didn't say it. So, um, and, and also I could say stop and I could mean you or I could mean you and your friend. So it's, un it's actually ambiguous yeah. whether I'm saying it, it'd have to be contextual, but I haven't said it. And, you know, they argue that it's an implied subject. And it's like, what do you mean it's implied? Well, if it's an implied subject, then why do we say that they always, why not just say, actually, they don't always need a subject in English, you know, yeah. because the imperative in English doesn't need a subject. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But it does even it that, even that, which is supposed to be the mega, like hard and fast rule of, um, you know, a, a, the ba a base sentence in English is subject plus predicate, and predicate just means verb and bits and bobs. Except, I've just told you, you can, you can you can say the imperative and you don't have to use a subject. So that's already, that's bollocks. So I feel like dance. you're just kind of <laughs> dissolving yeah. into a blob. Of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, so do I really exist? What is teaching? Um, I think we should get into, into this lady, grammar girl, old school. We should mention that she does have some respect in, because, you know, one of the things about our show is, you know, I kind of come at it from the angle that I've done the diploma and the tile and all that crap and, yep. and been to the British Council and the rest of it. And you've done the other side of, you know, muddling through in China with classes of 60 kids, yep. um, showing them PowerPoints and, and, and not sort of jumping through quite so many um, sort of, of the certificate hoops. A little bit more cowboy teaching. <laughs> Something like that. So so we have the, we can kind of have these two different things, but I think it is worthwhile saying that from the from the sort of the Celta world and the Delta world, mm -hmm. Grammar Girl does get some recognition mm -hmm. uh, to the extent where I've had tutors mention her and say, "Oh, Grammar Girl explains this rather well," or whatever. 
because I think it's a really important point because one of the things is what we have is we have English and English is such a broad subject and whenever people come across uh, and they're like oh I want to learn English so they they put in learn English or English grammar in into their search bar for their podcasts or for their YouTube or you know their internet in general and they you know the stuff pops up but the thing is is you know English is it's got varying it's a spectrum of varying degrees and levels and you know how it's kind of uh, ingested uh, so grammar girl I often feel kind of gets lumped into the English language teaching learning category when I don't feel it's it's related to our uh, industry but I feel it's more for English for native speakers they're just wanting to learn more about their own language but also um, it has it does have very uh, useful um, explanations and some are pretty re pretty mm. simple as well so it kind of lends into our world but to say it's focused on um, second English as second language speakers or it's for them I think would be confusing for many people that are like oh you know, I'm listening to Grammar Girl, but I'm finding it a bit difficult to understand. And that person's, uh, you know, trying to learn English and, you know, they're, they're at a low level. Well, that's because I don't think that it's necessarily aimed at you. Uh, and if it is, it's definitely a lot higher level. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, d I, I don't think... Is, is, is Grammar Girl intended for students at all? I mean, I've never watched it before, so I don't know, but well, I do you, know that... The, the important thing you, is you don't generally watch it. I mean, we are going to watch it some clips, but she uh, came um, into existence like in 08 or something and you know became a really mm, popular a podcast on iTunes. Oh actually it's right. a podcast it's you know it's auditory oh. and i you know i've recommended to her before but you know she does put the clips on youtube and she does other things for youtube because obviously you know everyone's mm. cross platform nowadays but when i when i look at the comments on you know podcasts uh, about her or on youtube it's a lot of people that are like i'm i'm an editor at blah 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 newspaper and I found this grammar explanation to be really good or you know I found this to be a ah, really um, you know interesting view or it helped me kind mm -hmm. of better understand for my purposes of writing so you know I know a few writers that are big grammar girl fans nowadays mm -hmm. she's kind of gone a little bit into the our realm our realm of you know teaching English because it, it right. lends that way because you know I saw a, a whole bunch of stuff around um, the 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 virus uh, that they were dealing with and her explaining you know pandemic and endemic and all that sort of stuff so it bleeds but you know we don't live in this black and white world anymore so um, you know mm. I, I think it's fine right. Yeah, but what what so what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump in and first we're kind of gonna look at her video content that she's put onto YouTube and then we're gonna have a quick listen to her actual podcast so mm. we can kind of you know I guess compare but also get a little bit of a, an encompassing flavor. Hi, it's Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl. Last week, two people asked me to explain why people say should have and must have. Uh, Sandy Pie 7 on Twitter and Lisa Chan on Facebook both asked. So when we're talking, you'd say, oh, I should have called my sister. Hey, Rach. <laughs> um, I must have forgotten her phone number. I must have left my phone at home. So when you're talking, it sounds as if you're saying must have or shoulda, but those words are actually contractions for should have and must have. So you know it's easy to see when you write them, 
should have, and it's abbreviated should apostrophe V-E, or must apostrophe V-E. So just remember they aren't spelled like they sound. You might say shoulda, woulda, coulda, but they're spelled as contractions. S-H-O-U-L-D apostrophe V-E and M-U-S-T apostrophe V-E and so on. For the, the YouTube, it's just basically uh, Q&As uh, and also she, she repurposes it. She will do specific mm -hmm. clips for, you know, if, it, if she feels it's important or what have you. But um, yeah, I like it. I, I think she's... Yeah, I like it too. It's mm. it's very natural. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's good. And it's a, it was a quite a nice crispy uh, explanation. It's sort of similar to how I would probably explain uh, shoulda to students myself. You know, whether it, as you say, it's her audience at this time was definitely more sort of English, people who are English English language speakers who are writers, I think was the, was probably one of their big audiences, wasn't it? But it's, it is pretty similar to how I even say the shoulda, woulda, coulda thing. Yeah. I think it's a nice little uh, shoulda, woulda, coulda, something that can stick in a student's head and help them remember. I like the fact she called it contractions. Um, not everyone sort of agrees with that, but I, I think, I think it's a good word for it. It's a good way of uh, explaining what happens when it gives a good visual speak in certain ways. Cause it, it, it gives that visual of like, yeah, being combined together, regardless of mm. you know, like how it actually yeah. works. But yeah, effectively, it's exactly the same thing as as can't and mustn't and all that. It's just we don't have written forms yeah. for it um, that represent that kind of really quick speech. That's all it is. So it's you know, spoken contraction is probably the best term that I've come across. Yeah. So yeah, and I, I think the, the 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 important one of the points that you just mentioned, and I think I want to repeat it because it's really important. It was quick. Mm. That that's all you mm. needed to know. That's all, and I kind of feel like that's kind of what grammar yeah. should be when you're teaching. It's just, mm. oh, question here, boom. Yeah, we don't need to expand out on this. We don't need mm. a you know a ten minute video of the blah 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 intricacies. The top ten. You know, mm. shoulda, mudda, coulda, with with a cat in a hat, you know, riding a, mm. a bat. You know, we don't we don't need that. It's just yeah. And uh, then yeah. you can say shoulda told them to go to the party, but then here's a useful no. Okay, no, it just we got to the point. Yeah, here's what it is. It's contracted. Mm. Hey, yeah. want to remember it? Shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Focus on communication. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to say as well what she did there. It's not exactly what I would call grammar. So kind of interesting that, isn't it? It's kind yeah. of a, from, from, from the English teaching perspective, I think maybe it starts to become a bit of a misnomer there because for me, that was more, I mean, it was use of English really rather than grammar. And we could even argue there was pronunciation, you know, yeah. there's a bit of a pronunciation in there. Of course, that's not what her audience were coming from because they know how to say it. They just didn't understand why we didn't write it that way. Right. So let's uh, jump into her bread and butter into the Grammar Girl podcast and have, oh, let's have a listen. Quick and dirty. So quick and dirty tips and we've got something dangling. Oh, Grammar yeah. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty and you can think of me as your friendly guide. I think she needs to come on to ELT under the covers with us, Neil. Guide to the English language. <laughs> I do Writing, like her branding. History, rules and cool stuff. Today, we're going to talk about dangling participles. But first, it's graduation season. So if you know someone who's graduating soon, here's a great gift you might be able to win for them. My podcast network, Quick and Dirty Tips, is running a sweepstakes. The lucky winners will receive an amazing bundle of books perfect for a new graduate, like a cookbook. So this is an audio podcast. Yep. So is this a thing that you said is on like iTunes or something? Yeah, that's why she became mm. super popular because, you know, it's just, one that you put in and you listen to as you're yeah. going, traveling around to work and stuff. Okay. All right, I'm just going to spin on a bit to get sure. past all this nonsense. Participles. We need to talk about participial phrases. These are just phrases that contain a participle and modify the subject of the sentence. They can include words besides the participle, such as prepositions, pronouns, and nouns. But for now, we'll just focus on the idea that they contain a participle like speeding or hiking. 
The way they modify the subject isn't as straightforward as a single adjective modifying a single noun, but the participial phrase is still modifying a noun or noun phrase, the subject. Here's some examples to help make it more clear. Floating in the pool, I marveled at the clouds. Floating in the pool is the participial phrase that modifies the subject, I. Floating is the participle in the phrase floating in the pool. It describes what I'm doing. Here's another one. Biting his victim, the vampire felt a momentary thrill. Biting his victim is the participial phrase that modifies the subject, the vampire. Biting is the participle in the phrase biting his victim. It describes what the vampire's doing. And one last example. Beating you over the head with examples, I hope to make you understand participial phrases. Beating you over the head with examples <clears throat> is the participial phrase modifying the subject, I. Beating is the participle in the phrase beating you over the head with examples. It describes what I'm doing. In all three of those examples, the subject that was being modified by the participial phrase came right after the phrase. It was sticking close to the modifier so you couldn't miss it. The participial phrase doesn't have to be at the beginning of a sentence, but that's the place where it's most likely to dangle. So we'll <clears> stick <throat> with that format today. And now we're ready to learn about dangling participles. Because when you dangle a participle, it means your participial phrase is hanging there in your sentence with no proper subject in sight. They hate that as much as you hate it when a friend stands you up for lunch. Here's an example. Hiking the trail, the birds chirped loudly. The birds are the only subject in the sentence, and they directly follow the participial phrase. So the participial phrase has to grab onto something, so it grabs the only subject, the birds. So what that sentence says is that the birds were hiking the trail, and that's probably not what I mean. There was probably somebody hiking the trail and hearing the birds chirping loudly. So here's the dangler again. Hiking the trail, the birds chirped loudly. We can fix it by adding a proper subject right after the participial phrase. Hiking the trail, Squiggly and Aardvark heard the birds chirp loudly. Now, hiking the... Right. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, all right. I think we get the idea. There is, I mean, her, her way of sort of explaining things is, um, is pretty, you know, it's, you can listen to her, can't you, and kind of, and go through it a little bit in your head and mm -hmm. maybe that's sort of part of the point i have to say this isn't how i would if i was um if i wanted to explain uh what she called dangling participles i don't think that would be my approach and i think in english teaching you tend to see this taught as uh something called ellipsis which is where we can Omit, again, we're talking about exceptions here, but we can omit words in what otherwise would be grammatically sound sentences to make them seem like they're no longer gra grammatically sound because word words are missing. But we explain that by saying that the words um, the words have just been taken out and we call that ellipsis, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, when she said, you know, uh, what was it? Swimming in the pool, I drank my martini or whatever. Um, then, the then it would be while while I was swim while I while I swam in the pool I drank you know so we just got the we just got the omission of those words which we can understand because of the context and then as she mentioned you can call them a I would probably go for a participle clause myself I think she called it a participle phrase uh, which I think is a bit a bit ambiguous for me if you want to talk about grammar but I'm not sure that I'd be that comfortable like getting into all that with students these days and in, in, in putting it in those terms. I think I would be tempted to present them phrasally, present them some useful phrases, get them to notice a few things about it, get them to use some of the useful phrases. And then, you know, it's like um, Chris, Chris Longs, Long, Long, Lonsdale. Chris, it's like Chris was saying the other day when we spoke to him, that um, 
you know, you kind of give people the phrases, they get to grips with them, they start using them, and then they, they automatically are able to extrapolate. They don't need you to point out that it's a, a participle phrase with ellipsis and, you know, all the rest of it. They, um, once, they, once they've got a few examples, they can sort of induce the rules themselves and they, and, and they don't even need to kind of have the rules clear and write them down. They just, they will naturally induce the rules mm -hmm. through using phrases of similar, of similar rule sets. So I think that would be my approach as a teacher. Um, but then, yeah, okay, if we're talking about writing, then maybe there's something to be said there for that although i think any native speaker would understand what what subject the dangling participle is dangling from yeah i i think um <clears throat> a couple of things just to piggyback on what you said with chris i what i think this um sort of thing is good for <clears throat> especially with grammar is when there's you're going through that f phase of just learning inductively and uh, you are just um, ab I, I don't, absorbing the language. And, you know, whether you consciously or unconsciously come to the uh, point of being able to use a specific phrase uh, and grammar structure correctly, um, it's if, if you... If you are doing it and then maybe you're not getting it or you are doing it but then you're you're making these frequent errors and it's not correcting itself i kind of feel like this is grammar is kind of like going all right let's go under the hood of this and see kind of like we we need to kind of look at this a little bit more and kind of explain it because you've gone through it a few times and you don't seem to be getting it and you know maybe it's Probably if you leave that person to do it more and more and kind of give them more practice, they might come to that realization and go through that discovery. But maybe you're short on time and you kind of want to, you know, help them out after they've doing a couple of months of, you know, like bashing their head against the wall. Then you go under the hood and you kind of mess with the grammar and so they can kind of see it because maybe they don't hear it or and they, they they need to see it visually so you've got to try different ways to kind of present it to them but i feel like that it's it's the option of going under the hood and you know trying to tinker with uh the the language that way rather than just kind of well everyone's going to learn you know english the same because we're all you know uh, we've all learned our own language, so why wouldn't we all learn the grammar if we just kind of are exposed to these phrases and structures specifically? So, but the thing is, we don't. We don't. We, mm -hmm. you know, s you know. Sometimes some people have difficulties with certain language points. Often, it's more to do with um, uh, pronunciation. You know, maybe it's it is your mouth movements, and it could be like an actual physical thing. You know, I the one of the problems, like for example, my sister, um, when she was growing up, mm. she actually went to a speech therapist uh, because she were mm. we couldn't understand. Well, I I mean, I was still a kid, but my my other than my mum, no one could understand what she was saying, and it was because you know she had like a small a small mouth or so, I don't know what it was called to and tongue tied something different but it, she basically was had a small so she had to do some sort of exercises to you know like uh, expand her mouth and that and then that helped her to be able to actually pronounce the words properly and stuff like that and I, there's a whole bunch of other things you know like that that could medically affect so i kind of see the place for this sort of grammar learning as maybe you're you 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 have a teacher that's wanting to go uh under the hood to kind of help you out and uh, along with the process or maybe mm. you are a writer yourself and you don't get it you're stumbling over this and you're like well why why does it not work you know i'm, I'm thinking about it and I just don't know how to put it into mm. my own words and then you listen to someone else like this and it helps that way. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I don't know if uh, yeah. you, I don't know if you understand where I'm coming from with that, but it's kind of like messing with the yeah. code of the Matrix. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes perfect. That's perfectly reasonable. But one of the things that I really liked uh, about Grammar Girl, and I don't know if it's just me um, and her style. I, I do like that. You know, she, I the the examples she uses are quite quite funny and you know yeah. it can be a bit tongue-in-cheek yeah. as well but the thing that yeah, i okay. really like is when she's talking about grammar um mm. and their relationships is she ah, i forgot the word for it she humanizes the grammar parts so yeah they are they are a relation i think what she does say mm. it's kind of like they, yeah. these two phrases are leaving you leaving yeah. your per, your friend in the lurch or something i can't remember what she said right, exactly right, right. but you know what i mean yeah. it, it kind of helps you visualize a little bit more that yeah. you're like oh an adverb is like that best friend that always yeah, you know yeah, like yeah, peps yeah. you up or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's good that stuff yeah, yeah it's so teaching isn't it yeah it basically yeah. and it kind of reminds me of like michelle thomas in his mnemonics and stuff but she mm. it gives you another way to see that a lot of the grammar is relationship a bull relationship blah, blah, blah. <laughs> she kind but, of anthropomorphizes is it yeah it, it doesn't she? gives yeah. It a bit of a narrative yeah narrative contextualization something like that yeah yeah yeah, and I, yeah, I yeah. think it I think it helps because it's not yeah. just, you know, looking at C plus plus. It's mm. it's actually having a little bit of a story. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean I like that she's kind of down to earth, you know. Mm -hmm. Um I think that's kinda of, that's it's it's quite you know, she just she comes I mean, this is twenty nineteen, isn't it? So two years ago that one we just listened to and um you know, it just sounds sounds all right. She hasn't. She's not overdoing it. She she's not all, you know, like me on Professor Rich. Hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't turned into a bloody influencer, has she? So um, I don't know. I kind of like that. There's too many people flying around, influencing. Um, yeah. So good job for that. Yeah, I like the down to earthness. I think depending on what you're doing, I think it would be a perfectly um, reasonable thing to recommend yeah i think she's she's within our realm of not being overly academic when it comes to this sort of thing uh, to mm -hmm. kind of present grammar in a way that's digestible <laughs> uh, uh, relatable and entertaining uh, as well which is really important you know like you could yeah. you could i i i would I listen to her um you know as i'm going uh, as i'm commuting and stuff and you know it's pretty easy to just throw like this on in the background and you know pick up snippets and let it you know seep yeah. in or what have you yeah, it yeah. doesn't have yeah. to be something where you sit down and you you're like oh, i got my okay here we go oh, oh and then i'm gonna draw I... no yeah to go back to earlier, I wouldn't say that this is a teaching English as a second language, uh, you know, podcast. It's not. It's not aimed. I don't think for non-native she, English speakers. Got, she, she has got some videos which seem to indicate that, though. Yeah, I th nowadays I, I think it kind of grew right, into that, okay. but I feel oh, like right, it, I see, it's I see, I see. it's um, yeah. generally. I, I wouldn't say that. Hmm. it would be that effective because I agree with you when right. she's giving those explanations, I would do it differently. Um, yeah. And I would probably right, not okay. do it as a podcast. I would, I would probably have something, you know, I would need the, the whiteboard as well. Yeah. Cause I feel it, it you kind of need a combination of visual and auditory mm -hmm. to kind of see mm -hmm. how it works. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I do like it. Cause I, again, relatable down to earth and um mm. it's easily digestible good job Grandma yeah Girl. it's not bad yeah, well yeah 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 it'd be interesting to have her on you know she's kind of a classic 
YouTuber teacher starry thing, you know, so we could see exactly what her contact is with education. How much does she see herself as a teacher? And if so, who are her students? You know, these could be quite interesting things to dive into. What's her name? Ming, Ming, Mignon? Mignon. 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 Mignon Flatter. Fulati. Fogati. Yeah. Mignon Fogati. An interesting name, isn't it? Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's probably, yeah. it sounds Irish to me. But, uh, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is Irish. Yeah. Yeah, Fogati. So, so I am, to be sure. Oh, dear God. <laughs> okay. uh well grammar girl if you are watching please excuse her just butchery or both our butchery of your name we'd love I'm to have I you i basically on. i'm irish okay. <laughs> sure we'd love to have you on um we'd love to uh get your perspective on what you do so if you're out there or if someone you is watching this and you are a fan of grammar girl you know you mm. send her a message as well and we'll do yep, our best yep. to get her on the show yep. and do a little bit more of a deep dive into her background because uh, mm -hmm. we like her stuff. Mm -hmm. Teamteacherchina.com, uh, lots of instant PowerPoint lessons that you can download and use in class straight away. Uh, Team Teacher China YouTube channel where we explain some of those materials, how to use it, demonstrate it. Team Teacher English where we take some of those materials and we put them into self-study video formats. And Team Teacher Baby where I take my experience as a teacher and put that into parenting. And then we have uh, the quick, the dirty reach. I've already done it pretty much. YouTube.com is Professor Rich, Twitch and TV, Profit Gaming, and uh, email, ELT, wait, email, what do you email? ELT under the covers at gmail.com if you'd like to come on the show. Thank you, you, for said, you said Everybody BLT under the covers at, uh, previously. Yeah. yeah. BLT. <laughs> BLT, but bacon, lettuce, tomato <laughs> under the covers. That's our follow up. We're going to. We're going to become a gastronomy podcast. <laughs> <laughs> BLT under the covers, baby. Two men uh, in a bed eating food. Yep. See you all next time.